Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure being here at, at my old uh, home institute, um, where where I where I wrote my dissertation and and. When I returned from MIT, I found another home here again, which was quite nice. Uh, so it's, it's always nice to come back. Um, yes, I should say thanks for the introduction. So, so um, although in my old days, uh, I used to work in artificial intelligence a lot, mostly in embodied artificial intelligence, so work with robots. Nowadays, I work more in philosophy. And although my philosophical education is mostly epistemology, which is uh, the philosophy of knowledge, Nowadays, everybody has to work in ethics. So this talk is, is about ethics. Um, in the old days, I was making fun of ethics, but yeah, what can you do? So the title of this talk is Ethics uh, and AI. I believe in the, in the handouts or in the original announcement, it was Ethics of AI, but I think Ethics and AI is better. Um, and it's about good AI versus the totalitarian enforcement of norms. Uh, and I'll explain what that is, so I don't have to. I don't have to give this away right now. Let me just start by trying to find out how I get to the next slide. Um, hmm. First, take a glitch. Well, that doesn't do it. That is cool. This is really cool because it it, it did it. Oh. Uh, maybe that's very slow. Or, or you need to really have press that. it hard. Anyway, there you go. So I will talk about ethics, obviously. So ethics is a, tries to answer the question: What to do? What should we do? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about principles. So the idea of do this. Then about agency, which is basically doing it. Uh, trolley problems and what to do with them. About what I would like to call full norms uh, or what we should not do. And, and then I have some conclusions uh, and I will discuss what to do now. Uh, and, um, and I'll start with ethics. Um, ethics is uh, a philosophical discipline. And I think that's important to understand. It's, it's not as sometimes it's being debated in the public, uh, a, a book that you open so that you know what to do. It is a philosophical discipline. It's a proper academical discipline. It's the philosophy of morality. So unsurprisingly, uh, as an academic field, uh, it debates questions from a very specific understanding, uh, in this case, of morality. And, and Bernard Gert is, a, uh, is a, an American philosopher who has given a definition of morality as an informal public system uh, that applies to all rational persons governing behavior that affects others and includes what are commonly known as the moral rules, ideals and virtues and has the lessening of evil and harm as its goals. And there is quite an important point in this definition that I would like to um, point your attention to and that it is an informal public system. So uh, different to, let's say, our legal system, morality is typically not encoded. It's a practice. It's the practice that we have. And ethics is the study of that practice, but not in the sense of studying it like in social science. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's considerations that are of a very principled nature, as I will, as I will continue to talk about. And it applies mostly to rational persons. That is also interesting when we talk about the ethics of AI, because actually, originally, morality is not about machines. It's about people. And it's only about a subset of people. It's only, it only applies to those people who are capable of rational thinking. So for example, it does not apply to children or crazy people, or at least only to a limited amount. And then, of course, it's about what you should do in a society, uh, and that concerns what, what our virtues are, what our ideals are. And of course, we would like people, for the most part, to be truthful, uh, to be courageous, to be honest, uh, maybe impartial in their judgment and reliable. Uh, and, and you can make long lists of, of, of things you prefer, prefer, and that's what it's about. So this is, this is really what philosophers uh, talk about. And, and the Greek ethos uh, is actually an expression for what is customary, what is, what is, uh, what is that that we usually do. And I think that's quite important to remember when we talk about ethics of philosophy. Now, 
as many of you will know, there is a long debate now and a very intense debate of the topic of ethics in, in the field of artificial intelligence. It concerns a broad range of issues. It concerns, for example, safety in autonomous driving. It concerns the question of fairness when it comes to autonomous decision making. Um, the example that I'm using here is the one of the uh, of the Austrian uh, labor market uh, support uh, office, which which was heavily in the media because they had a, they wanted to put in place a system that some considered as treating women unfairly. There is a big question in medical AI, for example, about transparency of the decisions and understanding what the systems do. There are issues of privacy, uh, of who is responsible when, when something goes wrong. And of course, there are big debates about what are the impacts of AI systems uh, in, in our work environments? How does labor change? How does, uh, how does the type of the jobs that people have, how does that change as soon as we start using artificial intelligence? Now, in, in many of those uh, questions, uh, of course, it is very often about actions that systems take. So, so this, is, this is what really concerns us. What, what, what's, what's our concern when we talk about the ethics of these systems? It's what does the system do to us? How does it change us? What are the consequences of the actions? Uh, and that could also be an influence. And then let me just although I'm not using this in this talk very much, let me just point out that uh, in many types of modern ethics, it's not just about people, it's also about um, animals, for example. What do we do to animals or even the environment? There is even a field that is called landscape ethics. So modern developments are much broader, and I think there are uh, important points to be made about this, but I'm not going to make this a talk about this in this talk. I'm limiting myself to people. It's complicated enough. Now, in principle, as I said, this is informal. And I think for everybody who works in, in computer science, and there may be one or the other present in this room, um, that already should ring an alarm bell. Because typically in computer science, what we deal with is formal systems unless we're building robots or unless we have cyber physical systems where we are also to some extent leaving the realm of the formal. Uh, we have suddenly have to deal with clocks and with forces and, and with forces and with batteries. Uh, but for the most part, large parts of computer science focus on the formal. But in ethics, very quickly, we enter the informal world. And also what I said about morality, it is an informal um, way of discussing what people should do and should not do. Um, but also, of course, we discuss legal aspects in ethics. Sometimes that is more formalized. That is, of course, um, let's say, a formal descriptions of what people should and should not do. So it's a bit of a mixed bag here. Um, but I want to emphasize that in, in when we talk eth about ethics of AI systems, we are interested in this agency. We are interested in the aspect that these systems act um, and they usually act in ways that have consequences for people. So uh, I think this is quite important to keep in mind. Uh, and I would like to include in these considerations also language, linguistic acts, speech acts, if you like, although speech acts has a different connotation. So um, there are, of course, also ethical issues that people have been recently talking about uh, as concerns large language models, for example, this again includes privacy aspects. There is a big debate about authorship and plagiarism, uh, about what this does to work, uh, about misinformation, about how these systems could be used for manipulation and deceit. There is a big debate around censorship, about fairness and bias, security, and of course, power and democracy are also important topics. So the action doesn't necessarily have to be a physical action. It can also be just, you know, a linguistic action. I think I would like to include this. And obviously, AI systems can impact on people. They, they can decide on people. For example, and the classic textbook example in ethics very often is denying a loan. Yeah? Someone gets a loan or does not. And then the question is, is the decision of the system fair? So, for example, does it treat women the same way as it does men is, is one of the questions that are often raised and discussed and unfortunately uh, very complicated when you look at them in detail. Or a decision of a system may lead uh, to someone losing a job or not getting a job in the first place because 
um, AI is nowadays broadly used in AR in HR management in order to help decision making when you hire people. But there is uh, this would be let's say a relatively straightforward way how these systems act and have an impact on people. Um, there would be questions of influencing people. I think that's also what we discuss broadly in, in when we have when we investigate social media and then the people complain how AI can be used in order to influence people and mm -hmm. and uh, trigger certain behaviors, be it purchasing behaviors, be it voting behaviors. So all of that. It can obviously hurt people when we think about cyber physical systems, autonomous driving systems. It can incur injuries. It can, of course, also lead to mistreating people when, in, when there is a wrong medical diagnosis, uh, bad medical advice. Uh, and I would argue that there is also a point to be made about knowing about people. That's maybe uh, less straightforward acting. Uh, so infringing someone's privacy, outing secrets about a person to the family, um, interfering with their dignity would be aspects where ethical considerations come into play that are related to, to knowledge about someone, uh, which is not usually considered an act. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would, like, I would like to say that or suggest that this is also something we should consider in this case here. And I would like to also make a positive point. These, all these debates that you find in the literature um, are interesting in that they are often triggered by having an AI system that may not be entirely ethical. For example, that, that has an aspect of being not completely fair or uh, that has an aspect of treating someone badly. Um, and these systems tend to at least make these unethical aspects explicit. So that's nice about the system. Yeah? I would suggest that in a way these systems are a mirror of our society and of our behavior and make explicit what may already be have been dormant in our society for quite some time. Yeah? It, maybe I, I research don't, researchers wouldn't like this point, but, but I think it's actually something nice about AI systems. So when we are modeling people using artificial intelligence, um, of, it's obvious that, that one of our constraints is that we are limited in what our models can know or can predict and can control. Yeah? So that is actually irrespective of the fact whether we are modeling um, behaviors of physical systems, of uh, lions, uh, uh, of I don't know what, bacteria uh, or, or some physics model. Uh, we are always limited. There are always limits to what we can measure, to the data we have, to the models that we can build, to the precision that we need. But there is an additional limitation, I believe, that, that as soon as we start modeling people, we are morally limited also in what we should do. Yeah? And that is a very different kind of limitation that is not always considered. So I believe there is also a question of should we control a person's driving, for example, uh, should we predict a person's talent or a person's time of death? And also, I would argue, should we know a person's gender, a person's political uh, conviction, uh, what a person does online or what they shop when they shop uh, for pharmaceutics? And I think this is, this is what is different as soon as we build AI models about people from other types of models that we build. And this is where the ethics obviously comes in. Now, traditionally in the philosophy uh, of morality, in ethics, uh, of course, there have been very different approaches and these approaches are very old. Philosophy is a discipline that is very uh, history aware. Uh, I think it was Marcus Peschel who once said, whenever you have a creative idea, a philosopher comes and puts it in a historical drawer. Uh, and and this, there is some truth to that. Uh, and, and, and of course, usually we start with Aristotle uh, and, and already Aristotle had a, an interesting and still relevant uh, idea about ethics, in his case, virtue ethics. So um, in order to decide what should I do, Aristotle suggested, oh, let's just look at what would a, uh, a virtuous person do. Uh, so let's look at someone who is typically courageous and truthful. Uh, and impartial. What would this person do in, in, in a given situation? Uh, and, and of course, that's not the whole story. Aristotle had an, an underlying principle, 
uh, behind those virtues, which was very much in his case about the nature of human being and the nature of human being basically in his understanding that humans are rational beings. So it's very much about these rational, this rational decision making that then lies behind this. But virtual ethics um, still has relevance today and there's a little bit of a revival of virtual ethics. Another way of approaching things would completely different would be um, consequentialism or utilitarianism or the util utilitarianism, it's a terrible word, um, where you just look at what the outcome of an action is. You just say, I really don't care whether you are a courageous person. Only the only thing that counts when I when you ask me what should I do is the result, is the outcome. And and a utilitarist like Bentham would say, let's maximize utility and happiness in the world, and let's choose all those actions only that maximize utility. This is, I would suggest, or I is my own judgment, um, a view that is very popular with engineers. Uh, and we could we could ask why, uh, maybe in the discussion, but but for some reason, and I think it, it may come from a, from design consideration, the end result uh, uh, resonates very well with with uh, with engineers. But of course, there's another stance that's historically extremely important. Um, the German one, the, the Kantian view of, of being a deontologist, where, where you chose those actions uh, that you could formulate formulate as a general rule, suggesting that everybody should leave, live and, and, and behave according to that rule. So in that case, it's a very rule-based approach. You look at rules that that, uh, that regulate what what you should and should not do. So what's interesting about this and why I'm bringing this is a that that you first understand that there is not just one ethics, there is a there is a, a different position within the philosophical disciplines of ethics, but there is also the question of reducing kind of this informal morality into to first principles. So much of ethics was and to a large extent still is concerned with in in a relatively formal symbolic um, structural way to derive what should be done from different types of principles, be it virtue ethics, be it consequentialist, be it deontological. And that I think is already very interesting to keep in mind because the question arises whether that's a good idea in principle. Um, because when you look at um, how we treat actions in practice, this is not really how we deal with it. Um, so if, if you think of a situation like a judge, now, of course, I know a judge is not necessarily an ethical person, it's just a legal person, but let's assume for, for a minute they are ethical. Um, uh, and a judge will not just look at the result of an action in a, in a utilitarist way of thinking. Uh, of course, it matters whether you killed the person or just hurt the person. But a judge will also ask, uh, was this action that led to the death of the person actually forbidden or not? So that would be the, the deontological aspect. And the judge would typically also ask, well, did you want to kill the person or not? So in practice, very often we have situations where we are mixing these things. And I think that's very important to keep in mind, although in ethics, uh, as a philosophical discipline, we are trying to develop these first, let's say, very, very nearly mathematical constructs from which you derive um, what should be done. In practice, always in, in our daily lives, it's, it's a very mixed picture. It's a mix of approaches. Now, when we look at what people have suggested in artificial intelligence and how to deal with all these consequences, the impacts that AI systems have on people, um, there is a lot of uh, proposals around and published uh, that that are in starting principles. They give um, principles that you should follow. Uh, now, these principles very often they they contain basic concepts that are relevant for debating an ethical aspect, um, and 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 then they are about concerns what what could go wrong in a sense and then very often you may also have in these principles some strategies and guidelines for addressing the challenge so one example would be fairness 
fairness would be such a concept, but also a value, and in this sense also a principle. And and the the call that many papers in the pub, that are published in the literature make uh, is for AI systems to be fair or to support fairness. Another one would be that they are um, explainable, for example. And there is no shortage of such lists of principles. Um, there is, I think, even there are websites that monitor how many frameworks of AI principles have been published. Uh, and that tells you already there is a lot. And I think the current count is above 200. Uh, so there are more than 200 frameworks of ethical principles for AI systems. And, and I don't want to sound like someone who's making fun of it. Um, but of course, the question then is, A, how different are those principles from each other? And B, do they help you in designing ethical systems? Is this, is this the answer? Now, um, one way to look at it is to, to first of all, in, investigate why principalism, this type of principalism, as I would like to call it, uh, is, is an answer, is a potential answer that people find attractive. And where does it come from? It obviously comes from the field of uh, bio uh, research. And in particular, it was, uh, it's an approach that was developed in response to horrific research. For example, Nazi so-called experiments uh, on Jews in concentration camps, but also um, this is very, very bad practices, completely irresponsible uh, research, such as the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. It's infamous because it studied syphilis without treating people and even telling people that they had syphilis. So uh, something that would not be uh, usually passed through a, uh, an ethical board today at the university, if that's what you would suggest. So, so this is where it comes from. It comes from this, very much from this experiments with people uh, that researchers had been doing and it, and also of course to non-research experiments with people and it resulted in a set of principles that that people should respect and one important document is is Tom Beauchamp and James Childress uh, uh, proposal of four principles autonomy uh, uh, non-maleficence beneficence and justice in in designing and implementing research uh, and it resulted in the end in a lot of guidelines that nowadays you find, such as the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, but practically every university has one such uh, research principles uh, that, that their researchers need to adhere to when they do studies. And when you look at this list, the autonomy, the non-maleficence, the beneficence and the justice, you will immediately realize this is actually very close to some of the proposals that are being made for artificial intelligence. And, uh, and the ethical framework principles for AI that you find um, could be reduced in many cases to, to different lists. It depends on how you structure the lists. It depends on whether you think that, for example, uh, transparency is something that belongs to justice or whether uh, fairness is a concept that is that should be formulated as a consequence of a just system. Uh, and then so you can structure them in many different ways. But there is research and people have look, looked into this, how many underlying basic principles there are. And so there's actually, for example, a proposal by, by Floridi, uh, who suggested really it's just four principles uh, that you can also find in the bioethics uh, experiments proposal, which is justice, non-maleficence, beneficence, and autonomy. And then there's one which is, which is actually special for artificial intelligence, and that is expl explicability, the fact that you should be able to explain what these systems are doing. And all the other things could be uh, kind of uh, sorted uh, under, under the other higher level concepts. Now, be that as it may, and I think there are, there are, there are different uh, ideas, and, but there is a good reason why we find these four and not others. And that is because the, the bioethical principles, they, of course, are very much interested in human autonomy. That's what they, that's what they actually want to value. Uh, and so it's unsurprising that there is a relation between whatever people want to suggest for uh, AI systems that also has to do with this with this ethical consideration because it's about autonomy and also about action. Uh, 
Yeah? And I think this is, this is where the relationship comes from. Now, many people have criticized these principles, and I think rightly so, for not telling you what to do. Yeah. So, and especially, sorry, in, in, in detail, how to do it, how to build systems now that are fair, that, that are non-maleficient, that are uh, explainable. And if you, if you know a little bit about the literature, uh, explainability has become a whole subfield of machine learning research. So it's easy to write it down in, a, in an ethical framework, but it's very, very hard to do. And, and I'll talk a lot about this a little bit. But let me just emphasize that I think this aspect of agency, of doing something, is really important, but it's a very complex concept. We may understand it as a capacity of someone to act, and that usually is interpreted, at least in philosophy, as a willful, intentional action directed at a goal. Um, and then there are questions of causation, volition, consciousness very quickly coming up. So did you really want to do that? Was this a conscious decision? Uh, what does agency really involve gets very hairy very quickly. For artificial intelligence, obviously, we may choose not to focus so much on consciousness yet. Um, uh, so for AI, maybe it's enough to say we have a system that receives data from the environment that then takes actions based on input data autonomous, autonomously with, to achieve some goals, with some gold, goal that, that it's either optimized for or that it explicit, has explicitly represented, uh, and then improve the performance by learning from interaction. That is actually Floridi's proposal. And I think the one takeaway thing that I would like to stress here is this is really, in this case, the emphasis by the, in the AI system is about the action and and Floridi went so far to say AI really is mostly autonomous action without much intelligence. Yeah? So he said what has happened in these late, latest success of AI system is separating the autonomous action making in, that was quite successful and is quite successful from intelligence as we used to understand it as this broad human contextual intelligence of which we don't still don't see a lot mm -hmm. eh? so uh, and i think this proposal is is an interesting one it focuses completely on the autonomy part and and hence on the action part so floridi says this divorce of action and intelligence is really happening because of this decoupling of the problem solving from the need to be intelligent that humans and also animals have developed eh? Um, and then I guess it's, it's, it would be much better to speak not of AI, but of artificial agency. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then hence the question of ethics arises quite naturally, because when we speak of agency, it, it's the question of what should we do, and doing is the agency. Mm -hmm. So this, this connects the two. Now in philosophy, very often um, what, what people are discussing and, and how they motivate their theories are dilemmata. And these dilemmata, for these dilemmata very often you, you use very simple examples um, that then motivate your choice of theory or your, your, your point and your argument that you're trying to make. Um, and, and I think um, many of such problems are also being studied in the context, in the current debate about AI ethics. Um, so one debate that, that is, of course, an important one is, is the question of what should an autonomous driving agent or a car that is driving autonomously do and what should it not do? Yeah? What are the ethical questions that arise when AI systems intervene in human decisions making? That starts with driver assistance systems. Um, should a system hinder you from changing the line, uh, that already could be viewed as limiting human autonomy and creating machine autonomy to some extent. Yeah. To the point, where should the system go or not go, or when should the system break or not break, or in which direction should it drive. And very quickly, we arrive at the infamous trolley problem. The trolley problem is one of the most discussed philosophical, ethical problems in the, in the literature, whole books 
I would say, small libraries have been written about the trolley problem. Uh, and, and usually the way it's formulated is you have a, a car, a trolley, uh, that is, is out of control and threatens to kill um, a group of people. And then you have a possibility to intervene, for example, by someone at a switch who can in help instead of five people being killed, only one to be killed. And that's the trolley problem, and it raises a lot of philosophically interesting questions. So the first question, of course, is what's better? Should we kill five or one? The second question would be, has this person at the switch a duty to act uh, or not? And then there are many variants of this problem that, that will lead people to different uh, decisions. So intuitively, often people will say, of course, it's better to kill only one person, and there is, but then, of course, the question is why killing that person when actually we are now intervening and doesn't the person at the switch become responsible for killing this one person now, whereas originally no one was responsible. It was just a technical failure or, or an act of God, if you like. And then there are variants such as you put a man on a bridge, a fat man, and, uh, and the, the man is, is heavy enough uh, that you can just push him off the bridge and he, rail, he lands on the rail track. Uh, so he would stop the, the the tram and then many people would say yeah but that you really cannot do yeah flipping a switch is fine but pushing a man off a bridge is not okay yeah? or you could construct a very similar case where you say uh, you have a car accident uh, and um, unfortunately there are now five people who need organs one needs a lung another one needs a liver another one needs a heart and so on and just by chance, there is a young man in the, in the hospital who came in with a broken leg and he happens to have a heart, a lung, a liver and so on. So should we use his organs in order to save the five people? That is, in terms of consequentialist outcome, very much the same case. But there are hardly any people who would suggest that this is what we should do. Yeah? So and this is very interesting. So how we frame this problem makes a big difference in how we look at it. And this problem is very often discussed in, a, in, in this AI sense of providing us information about autonomous driving. But of course, this is highly questionable. It's highly questionable that, that this is actually a point to be made um, because it's a very bad model of a practical driving situation. Uh, in practice, I think this is a situation that hardly ever happens uh it's it's a completely theoretical construct it has probably zero applicability in the real world and not only that it suggests technical solvability by discussing the problem like a trolley problem you are assuming it has a technical solution and it can be decided whereas in practice most car manufacturers would actually have a very simple uh, rule that they basically reduce the energy, they break as much as they, as hard as they can, reduce the kinetic energy and hope that that saves the most people. A, an active decision of a car that, for example, if the driver would be killed instead of a group of uh, passers-by would make the car very difficult to sell in most cases. Uh, so. So really, there, so there, is a, there are a lot of questions to be asked about these types of problems. They are, they are not in any way solutions to, to an ethics of autonomous driving, I would suggest. Yeah? Uh, and I think this is important to keep in mind. Now, unfortunately, the situation is not much better when it comes to fairness discussions. So, so let's take this classic example where we have an AI model uh, that has learned that in the past, most engineers, at least in some parts of the world, uh, were men. And then it models this in its model. So engineers are mostly men, is the type of knowledge that becomes represented in the model. And, and then you could use this model in order to select engineers for open job positions. And if you follow the model, obviously would, you would choose men as engineers with the result that you get mostly male engineers. Now, there is nothing wrong in the sense of that this model isn't correct. It is just the fact that you're basing the model on what we would nowadays call something that is biased or perhaps unfair 
uh, and that we would say would actually politically say socially politically that the past should not be extended into the future like this yeah so we are intervening in this type of decision making as a society and we say look this is really not okay it's a correct model of the past but it shouldn't be like this in the future unfortunately we are always bound to make models of the past even our model of gravity is based on measurements that we have performed in the past if gravity changes tomorrow these models will be wrong in the case of gravity unfortunately we cannot have a political opinion about how it should change uh, well we could but it's, it's unlikely we could implement it uh, but in the in in the case of the engineers obviously there is a political point to be made there is a social decision to be made about this now that's the easy part the more complicated part is how should we implement fairness and and one of the big problems is that there is not just one fairness uh, conception in the world and these fairness conceptions they may actually depend on the type of situation that we have our fairness decisions may be different for choosing engineers from who should get a grant or who should get a loan uh, or who should get a certain medical uh, treatment um, it's not enough to say this is unfair we also need to as a society develop an understanding what is fairness yeah? so should the black and white applicants have the same loan approval rates or should they have the same rejection rates which only theoretically is the same not in practice or should the uh, should we replace a black person with a white face uh, but with similar other attributes um, should we treat them you know as prototypes there are many debates we can have what is actually fair it's not a mathematical uh, easy solution there's not a mathematical uh, answer to this on the other hand if you implement a model you have implicitly defined a fairness model. Yeah. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. You are, it's an inescapable question, but we do not have a straightforward mathematical answer. And these, the questions to, the, the, the answers to these questions need debate, they need political discussion. Here's another example. In the past, um, we have calculated our insurance premiums for rich people with big houses uh, at a rather high level because we thought they have uh, expensive things in their houses and the houses are expensive to repair if they burn down and we think this is fair. Now with data analysis we can be a bit more clever and we know now maybe that young drivers that uh, that want to rent a car should, should have higher uh, uh, rental fees because they are more prone to accidents than older drivers. And that is a question. This is actually what I think implemented in many parts of the world uh, to the extent that very young drivers may be excluded and it's not possible for them to rent a car. And I think by and large, most of us would say that is fair to some extent. Now, when we add a smart control, we could actually do much more. We could say, look, we know that young men um, under a certain age are really dangerous drivers on weekends, especially um, weekend nights and they cause much more accidents and they are really heavy should we equip their cars with a box that makes it impossible for them to drive at night on a weekend or should we then at least give them a reduction if they equip their car with such a device and there are countries in the world that say yes we should do that and yes we should adapt our insurance system uh, to accommodate for that and then there are other countries where such systems are more difficult to sell, for example, in Europe. But we could go even a step further with artificial intelligence. We could uh, actually let the car propose, for example, a safe route. Um, and if you decide against this route, uh, you would be charged a higher insurance fee dynamically and completely automatically and maybe depending on traffic. Is that something you want to have as a society? So this type of discrimination that we want is a choice. It's a, it's a societal choice, and it is something that we politically have to agree on. And I'll, I'll skip the, the, the types of, uh, let me just say that um, there are, of course, 
considerations about this. And usually we would say, well, you could only, you should only discriminate between those um, parameters that you can actively influence. So it should not be your ethnicity or your gender, um, or, because that's something you cannot influence. But there is even a debate to be made about what can you influence. So uh, I think in, for example, in the US, people would say your, uh, your degree or not degree is something you could influence. Whereas in Europe, we would be perhaps more realistic and say, really, it's something that you can only influence so much, but really your parents and where you come from uh, play a big role in that. And there is limitation on what you can actively influence. So even there uh, is, a, is a question to be made. And, and finally, let me, let me just briefly talk about something that I know is also an active research field here at the Institute. Uh, it's the question of uh, content moderation, um, and and I'm on on the screen. You have an example of uh, of chatbots as child companions. Uh, that is one of the triggers why people discuss uh, content moderation now. Also with chatbots, um, there's a famous case where uh, a chatbot uh, recommended to an underage uh, person. Uh, that was claiming that, that he or she was meeting with an 18 years older person uh, and, and having sex for the first time, uh, giving some recommendation of setting the mood with candles or music and so on, uh, and raising the question as whether there should be limitations on how to speak. And, and again, of course, we know that for many reasons, um, there, is, there are uh, types of content uh, that such systems can create that that are actually illegal. Yeah, this would, for example, be denying the Holocaust, distributing Nazi symbols is something that at least in Austria and I think also in Germany is prohibited by law. So this is content that is considered illegal and needs to be eliminated. You can also not incite for terrorist uh, acts. You cannot uh, provide instructions for illegal actions. That is also illegal content and, and this needs to be removed. Um, then there are other actions for which the situation is less clear. So, for example, if you guide someone um, through a suicide, that could be considered participation in a suicide. And theoretically, at least a chatbot could do that. That's a question whether that is legal or illegal. I don't think we have, we have a case where that applies, but there would be an argument to be made that this is actually also illegal or creating, at least in Austria, child pornography with a generative model is illegal because at least in Austria, it doesn't depend on actual pictures of the act. Uh, it's enough to create uh, a simulated picture that's already illegal in Austria, not under other jurisdictions where it would have to be real persons being depicted. And then, of course, a lot of questions arise in the context of intellectual property. Now, this is not so much a toy problem, but it is a problem that um, that uh, is, of course, very often addressed by means of technology. The, the, the state of how this is being addressed is very typically to search for formal criteria in such texts and then decide whether they are illegal or illegal. And I will come back to that, uh, to that example. Uh, I just wanted to list it here as, as one of those problems uh, that are currently heavily debated in, in AI. So let me now come to the full norm implementation uh, or what you could also call complete enforcement. I'm actually borrowing a term from a German uh, social scientist here who calls this the, uh, the full vollzug der Norm, the full completion of the norm. And I took inspiration from a Viennese um, um, political decision uh, about e-scooters. Um, there is in this city a relatively big uh, discussion about uh, the untidiness of our streets caused by e-scooters being left everywhere in the streets. And, and the uh, city of Vienna negotiated with the companies owning those e-scooters uh, that they need to be put in special parking spaces for e-scooters, but also that they should be automatically limited in the speed that they can have when they uh, operate in pedestrian zones. So what the system does really is 
uh, it implements a norm, in this case, a speed limit, uh, in a way such that their violation becomes virtually impossible, uh, maybe except for some, I don't know, some computer science students that know how to hack the systems and can pretend some other GPS coordinates, or I don't know what uh, you could think about it. Uh, but for most people, it is impossible to violate the norm of going above the speed limit here. So this is what I mean. This is, this is the full implementation of the norm. The norm exists, the norm is a speed limit that operates in pedestrian zones, and it has always been there. Uh, and the rule is you must not violate it. So we build a technical system in order uh, not to make it possible for people to violate that rule. Now, the question, of course, is, and I think here we need to really be absolutely clear that we live in a society that is increasingly digital, where more and more data is available, where we could theoretically build more and more AI systems that control maybe not every, but a large portion of our lives automatically. We could, the question then is, should we aim at a society that not only punishes unruly behavior, but makes it impossible? Yeah, and, and, and the examples that I've brought are all such examples. It's about driving, it's about um, language, it's about um, parking your car, uh, it's about speaking and so on and so forth. Or should we have a right to violate the rules in principle? Should we have the right to violate the right? That is the question. Now, these debates very often are triggered in a context where they are freedom versus safety discussions. So here's an example of a, uh, I think, a uh, terrorist attack uh, in, I forgot which Nordic country, I believe it was Sweden, uh, with a truck uh, that ran into a large group of people and led to a, to a suggestion, that, suggestion that such trucks should be equipped with geofencing as a solution so that we can automatically enforce speed limits depending on where this truck is driving or whether uh, also on the weather maybe. Yeah? Um, there are other options that have been discussed. For example, switching a hybrid vehicle into E-mode when it enters a pedestrian zone uh, or the impossibility for rental cars to cross the border. Yeah? And then the question, of course, arises, but what about freedom? What about human decision making? Also, what about privacy, by the way? But, but this is one of the fundamental issues that uh, I think we will see increasingly. There will be more and more debates about this. And the question is also, how should we build the systems? Because, of course, we could also build them differently. But before I go there, um, let me just make you aware of the fact that these systems really turn around what we normally have in our society. Normally, uh, our law, for the most part, uh, punishes illegal acts after they have been taken. So there are consequences that you have to face when you do an illegal action. Now, in the digital world, we are actually turning this around. There is an ex ante limitation of the possibility to act illegally. And very often, this is, by the way, also privately enforced. Yeah? So the, the example would be the rental car. Uh, uh, it could also be publicly enforced, which is maybe half the situation that we have in Vienna. Yeah? But as we are moving towards a post-digital life, really this question of private enforcement of the law ex ante, uh, what it would lead to is the elimination of the ability to act unlawfully. It's clear that there are good reasons why we want to have that maybe. So first of all, of course, it's a limit, limitation of personal autonomy. Yeah. You, can, you are limited in what you can do. Okay. It's the, then some philosophers of law argue that uh, you should have the right to violate the right, yeah. um, at least for those laws that do not have dramatically bad consequences, such as killing someone. Um, what it also does is, and that's perhaps more interesting, it disregards exceptional circumstances. Yeah? There is, I guess, no police officer in the world and definitely no judge that will give you a ticket if you are exceeding the speed limit with your pregnant wife in the car and you're driving to the hospital. So 
laws in real life have exceptions. Our life is not so formally ruled as it appears. It is for the last, for the most part, informal. Then sometimes we want to act against the norm in order to protest against the norm. We want to actually, you know, we, we think a speed limit of 100k on some part of the motorway is wrong, and this is why, are, why we are violating it. It's a conscious choice. And then, of course, it disregards completely that there may be errors and, and there may be intention in, in what we do. So there may be uh, errors in the measurement of the system, and then we are bound to whatever the system decides about us. Yeah? So that's, that's another big question that, that I'm uh, not going to discuss any further. So, uh, and I just want to make you aware that, for example, in some parts, such as in online uh, content moderation, we already are very much to such a si in, in, in this situation. The identification of problematic content online is very much already an ex ante implementation of a norm, and it goes far beyond what is actually legally um, proposed or legally uh, suggested. Yeah? So what is nowadays, for example, remove the online networks is not just what is illegal, but also what some consider inappropriate or unwanted. Yeah? And the reason is that, of course, this implementation happens through private actors who have other interests, who, for example, also have uh, a business interest. I do not think that the makers of modern uh, large language models limit what these systems can talk about so much for ethical reasons, but it's mostly business reasons. Uh, these systems are limited in, well, it is, they are, the designers try to limit them, but it turns out to be really difficult uh, in what these systems can talk about because certain ways of talking would just make the system more difficult to use and to sell, for example, for children or in other contexts. Uh, so this is another, uh, another really important debate. What we are moving into here is a type of extension ethics. Uh, if you look at this picture by Caravaggio, um, and we did the experiment, um, actually this uh, was classified by, I think it was, I don't remember which, which, uh, which chatbot it was, as a pornographic image, obviously. It could as well be a medical image, this poor guy has a problem with wings. Uh, but, but of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's art. Yeah? It's an artistic image. That's what it really is. Um, leaving out the question of whether, whether Caravaggio actually had a relation to pornography here. Um, but um, but this, is a, this is an important decision. By deciding only on external properties, only on the form of the image, uh, we are moving into a realm that is very different from what we used to do so far. This is not the practice we have. If, if such an image would go to a judge, at least in this country, there would be debates. They would say, well, what Caravaggio would be asked, well, what did you intend to draw? And, and then there would be, in, actually in the German law system, pornography is defined as, with, as a picture that is produced with the intent of sexual arousal. Um, so that I'm, for some, a horse would probably qualify, but, but that's a different question. And then there would be, you know, an assessment and the judge would discuss it. In the, in the formal online decision-making processes, this is not taking place. We act as if everything is in, in the formal criteria. Intentions, however, are never depicted. Intentions are also not literally stated in the text. What we do is second guessing in this case. Yeah. And this is not a theoretical debate. Uh, this is very much a part of the debate that we currently have at the European level when we talk about this online scanning of private communication in order to identify, for example, child pornography. But it's not just limited to that. Actually, the case is much more relevant in the case of intellectual property rights violation, where again, same questions arise, for example, in the old systems, we would have had to judge, is this a creative use of the, of the painting, of the, of the symbol, or whatever a, uh, an illustrator may have created. Uh, but now it's reduced to being identified as someone's creation and automatically stamped, perhaps, as a violation, as an infringement of intellectual property.
So the question then is, and I'm coming to the end, uh, are we moving to, towards what you might call the totalitarian technosphere, uh, following the Mussolini principle and, and definition of totalitarianism, tutto nello state, niente al di fuori del stato nullo, contro, nulla contro la stato. Um, that depends on what you mean with totalitarianism. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, I do not believe it's, it's full totalitarianism because uh, as it is defined, it is very much about a, a terror regime, but it has certain characteristics of it. This way of using digital system is very much a bureaucratic idea. It's an ex ante application of, of, uh, of digital powers. Uh, it is something that Zubov warns about and says there are totalitarian trends following economic pressure in moder modern surveillance capitalism. Uh, it is something that uh, Carr has been suggested in the trend away from individualism towards totalitarianism, where, where a group uh, forces another group to act in certain ways. Um, and even Hannah Arendt suggests that the essential, essential element of totalitarianism is the loss of space for action, or as I would say, agency. Through terror, that is not true. We have to replace terror with digital systems here. Yeah. And, and there are certain characteristics which, which I think are quite important to discuss and debate. The idea of creating a new society, of a technical fix to societal problems, a certain truth claim that totalitarianism has that may also be associated with this digital uh, ex ante implementation of the law. The idea of total power, however, I concede it's not a party power, it may actually be a democratic power even. Yeah. But this idea of an unlimited sphere of influence that it works totally again is a characteristic of totalitarianism there are certain aspects that are not present we are not usually talking about a leader or a dictator it's not a system of terror that is in place but it's a system of of digital enforcement um, so uh, the question whether it is a good idea to technologically or in this case digitally um, eliminate the possibility to act in disagreement with set norms is the question I would like to ask. And, and so in my conclusions, uh, and I think they are also mostly open questions and we can discuss them, I would say that much of the AI ethics debate still ignores or simplifies the relevance of context and politics. When you read the literature, it is still full of toy problems, of trolley problems, it is still of still full of these reductions in also in this ethical theoretical sense to first principles, which I don't think will in the end help us because one AI ethics does not exist. The core question of AI ethics is agency and from the human perspective, autonomy. These are the two things that actually I believe are at the core. The a big problem in this debate is to to um, to say it um, well um, with, uh, with the Spice Girls, we do not know what we want, what we really, really want. Uh, it's, it's, it's just ethically provisional decisions that we can take, uh, something that is at the point in time acceptable, but never perfect. But that's not how the debate is happening in AI ethics. It is actually quite the opposite. It's more like a mathematical problem solving debate. Um, I'm a bit afraid that digitization shifts morality away from intentions, from what people want to do, and moves extremely towards formal properties. But I also think that techno-totalitarianism can be addressed on many levels, including a design level. To, get, to use the e-scooter example, I mean, if you really want to control it, one way would be to automatically ticket all those people uh, and 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 have them pay, I don't know, 10 euros uh, if they violate the norm, rather than making it technologically impossible to do that in the first place. And I think that's where I would like to end. Thank you very much.